getting back to like old style malware, like Netcat and and Poison Ivy and 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 all of the things, all the malware that we used to love. Um, so who am I? I'm Rob Fuller, um, dad, husband, Marine, um, also a red team director at these uh, these times. And so let's talk about the problem statement. Uh, malware in general um, has gotten harder to develop, and which is a good thing, right? Like getting to the point where where you know initial access and 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 um, exploitation is hard is kind of what we're all in this for. Unless you were listening to the uh, to the last speaker about um, nation states, where they're they're absolutely not trying to get things better, I assume. Um, but like for all of us that are in the industry, in infosec related uh, pen testers, blue teamers, red teamers, um, we're all kind of trying to work our way out of a job, and and malware development in general has gotten a lot harder. Um, there's automated cloud submissions with Defender and all of the other AV vendors. There's automatic sandboxing and behavioral analysis and virus total and EDRs, um, and it's just getting harder. Um, in like, and but I'm only really talking about Windows, right? So if we're if we're looking at things, Windows is is where all of the exploitation really is is still for you know, at this point, but there is, you know, a vast majority of, of Linux boxes out there and for servers and, and um, Macs that are out there for like um, end user workstations and EDRs on those and AV on those aren't really there yet. They're not, they're not to the point, but the nice thing is that on Mac, at least they're doing a really good job at keeping the OS to the point where, um, the EDRs really don't have to do that much work. However, if we can still run PHP um, to run a PHP interpreter session or shell from the internet, um, like I have in the demo um, below, you're still getting exploitation, right? Like Macs and, and Linux and Unix systems are still there. Um, so let's talk about Windows, Windows in, in particular. And so the solution to all that is virtualization and emulation. Like it's it's in interesting that every time that exploitation and and malware development and all of these things get um, harder, every time they get harder, the IT side of things are inventing new things and and new ways to do things that then the malware kind of migrates into. And so virtualization and emulation are this, you know, not new, but like emerging as the common ground that every client system even has, right? And we'll talk about some of these, right? We'll go into some of these. But like, what was the last time that you, had, you know, were on a, like, on a system that wasn't either virtualized or had, you know, um, in the in the uh, processor virtualization turned on, like the VX uh, the VTX um, technology on uh, on Intel and all of the other um, virtualization stuff. There's even been malware that has virtualized itself in the in the in the EFI BIOS, um, and like that's way beyond me. I I don't have a demo for that. I wish I would, but like that kind of stuff that that complexity, that virtualization makes it so that it gets past all of these uh, solutions that we have on, on the OS, on Windows. And so we'll be talking about some of these. Well, there's a, a few of these we're going to dive into, but um, uh, KVM, QMU, Citrix, Azure, AWS, Docker, v, uh, VMware, GCP, uh, and one of my favorites, uh, uh, WSL. So the, I have this history question mark here, mostly for the fact that I want, um, I want some help here. In around 2008-ish, there was a wonderful talk at DEF CON, and I can't find it, um, where someone talked about having a piece of malware that was completely in the JVM. And 
it was virtualized as an entire, basically a virtual machine. It wasn't Windows, but it was like Linux inside of uh, the JVM. And they were running um, a C2 directly in that. So I want to give credit where credit is due, but I spent probably, you know, days on this, like multiple days trying to find this so I could give credit. But I don't know who it was and I don't know where it is. But if if you know it, please let me know. Um, it was a wonderful project, kind of died on the vine, like most DEF CON tool releases do, um, any, any conference, right? Um, and if you know it, if you can find it, if you know where, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, please, please, please let, let me know. Um, and so we'll get the ball rolling and I've been just, this is a tweet for me in 2015. I've been uh, harping on this, um, and on this track for a while. I think that, um, virtualization emulation have been the go-to for malware for a while now. It just hasn't been super popular yet. There has been um, a huge increase in the last uh, year, two years, where where um, not ransomware, but like crypto miners have found open Docker sockets on the internet and just thrown their own you know Docker images into um, those registries and those systems. And I think that that is definitely where things are going. Um, something similar to this, and we'll we'll talk more about the other things. So let's talk what virtualization platforms are out there. We have Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, uh, GCP, IBM Cloud, Bluemix, and every other planet provider that has Docker, Kubernetes, or virtualization. So in the cloud, we when we when we talk through um, these virtualization, and most people don't think of of, of um, cloud is virtualization but they are right they they are taking their base os whatever it may be and they're adding a a service layer onto it and then they're they're taking that service layer and adding your stuff be it um be it the ec2 be it like um vpc like they're adding your stuff on top of that and so if i as an attacker can go next to it instead of on it, then I can get network access that you probably uh, never knew, you, you won't see it, right? So let's talk, let's go into a case study. Oh, we'll talk a little bit more about the different platforms, sorry. Um, so then you have ESXi and vSphere. Now we're gonna actually talk about a really cool attack that I did um, uh, with vSphere and ESXi. Um, but there's also KVM. We're going to be showing a little bit of K KVMU. If you don't know what that is, it's an, it's an emulation platform. Nutanix AOS, OpenStack, Citrix. There is some really cool tricks that I'm not putting in this talk with OpenStack where you can spin up an entire st stack, an entire um, virtualized, uh, virtualized compute unit without ever showing up in the, in, uh, um, in the platform itself. You just classify it as is part of the OpenStack um, uh, setup, and it just disappears. Anyways, so you also got Citrix. Citrix is an interesting one when you're talking about having uh, multiple Citrix server or services on on different Windows machines, and what you can do inside of the Citrix uh, process without ever actually what. Well, you still touch this, but like. Um, without getting picked up by EDR. And then we're talking about workstations. So if I exploit a workstation, if I get onto a system itself, um, what are the things I have? And if you find, if you're lucky enough to like fish or, or get onto a machine that has VMware workstation player or fusion, then you're already off to the races. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. VirtualBox, Hyper-V, same thing. And the cool thing about Hyper-V is that you can install that on any Windows 10 system that's been updated, and hopefully they have. You can install that directly from the command line. So if you pop a shell or even get, um, if you get a, uh, a, serv a, a user to, to install Hyper-V for you, um, it, is, it is gangbusters off to the races because Hyper-V is 
completely headless um, for the most part. Like you have to RDP into a, a, a system to get access to the console. Um, and the interesting thing about that is like, if you talk about VMware Workstation and Player and Fusion, all of those by default have the console in your face. And um, so as an attacker, as a malware developer, I don't want the console showing up um, for my victim um, or for the target on, on, you know, on their desktop. I want it to uh, hide in the background and Hyper-V, hands down, I don't know what, what, <laughs> what it is about Microsoft about developing PowerShell. And like, these are, these are really awesome tools for bad guys too. Anyways, so parallels that's still around. It's it's awesome, um, and and then Docker and WSL. If you don't know what WSL is, it's the Windows subsystem, and we'll get into that in a second. So cloud case study. Here we go. Um, this has been talked at about ad nauseum, so I'm not going to go too far in. Um, and the reason I'm not is because like. It's, I'm not going to go into tooling. Um, there's there's a tool that I'm going to mention, but the deploying a new EC2 instance with stolen keys or whatever, that's been done quite a bit. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that because Amazon um, in particular, and, and some of, you know, some of the other platforms have this the problem too, because Amazon has it broken down in a region, and it's kind of hard to know what region has what assets very easily. Um, you can put an EC2 instance in a far reaching region and it can sit there for years without ever even being looked at. Um, and so the only problem with that is that if you put it in into a region they don't know, all you get as a malware, as a as a attacker, is um is another shell it's another c2 or a system that you have it doesn't have access it's probably not going to have access to their, their internal network or any other extra extra network connectivity it's probably not going to have access to um any other systems in aws um for that account but with that said um there are ways to tie vpcs um, between different um, between different regions, um, but each time you do something, each time you access or have something access another part or the the active region they're in, then you start getting higher up on that alert scale. Um, but I've been super effective um, in doing this in real engagements. Um, it's a lot. Uh, quieter to go have your EC2 instance in another region and do the VPC pairing um, between um, the different regions. Um, or I, I think it's called pairing. Um, way to do it between regions. And then um, the the nice thing is that it only shows up on their 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 VPC side. Um, the the downside of that, or the, the nice thing, is that you can keep that going on, and hopefully that has internal access. Hopefully that has other things. Another sneakier method that's also been talked about pretty um, well in Twitter and, and other um, blogs and stuff is malicious Lambda functions. These Lambda functions are essentially serverless uh, executions that you can say, hey, every 24 hours or anytime they deploy a new um, EC2 instance or anytime they do this, um, you can uh, have it do something for you, run some Python. And it'll, and depending on the permissions you give it, it can have access to a bunch of things. So like, for instance, um, and I have here, create new keys anytime old keys are deleted. Um, that was talked about at a, at a previous uh, co conference too. Copy files from EC2 instances on a schedule. So. Um, one of the ways that I have used this is essentially uh, had a Python function that had impacket built into it that would every so often um, it would parse the the domain controller that they had in EC2. They had a domain controller uh, on a target had a domain control in EC2. So th what this would do is it was take a a file from the snapshot of that EC2 instance that they would take every day, 
And as soon as the snapshot was created, it would then pull down the ntds.dit, parse it within packet, and send me the current domain admin's password little hash. Um, and I had that going, and it would send me just the just the hash um, every time it happened, which was once daily. It was fantastic. Um, and so um, the tool that I, I mentioned was Endgame. Endgame is a AWS pen, pen testing tool. There's been some controversy around it. Like it's switched a bunch of different um, different repos. I don't know why. Um, I'm sure there's a good reason, um, but it's out there. The code's really good. Like it. Um, the only thing I would say there's a there's a demo in there. It's called N uh, Smash. Don't do that. It's like they have a way to recover it, but like it basically adds permissions all over the place. So that's um, near impossible to get, you know, fixed. So don't ever smash a, a client. Um, but there are great um, tools to do, like some of the things that I just mentioned, like pulling, uh, putting a Lambda function in, doing EC2 parsing. Um, one of the... Um, And and so yeah, there's so how do you fix things? Um, CloudTrail, all the things. Um, there are additional new features in AWS. I'm still learning. Like there's 170 services in AWS, and and all of them are super complex. So there's new services that do a lot of um, a lot of uh, auto detection of CloudTrail log of mal malicious actions in CloudTrail logs. Uh, but you still need to have CloudTrail turned on to do all this, right? So um, CloudTrail, all the things in AWS, whatever the ancillary is in, in GCP and as Azure, I, I, you should do the same there and get all of your logs in, in the same place um, or, or at least have someone that's looking at all of the different places you have logs because um, getting exploited in the cloud, getting... Uh, is a lot harder to detect than on-prem because you don't have much, as much possibilities or much detection points as you normally do. So, ah, this is this is one of my favorites. And um, there is an individual watching right now who was a part of this actually. So I'm sure he, he is excited to see it as well. Um, so um, VMware ESXi, um, usually, um, vCenter is all ADAP, uh, AD integrated. It has LDAP. Um, it's usually over permissioned. Um, if you find vCenter, uh, there's a good chance that like domain users can log in. They might not be able to do anything, but um, domain users can log in um, and see all of the different uh, uh, like clusters and 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 ESXi servers and stuff like that. Um, finding those users is not exactly trivial, um, like the ones that have admin access over it. But the nice thing is, if you're able to log in, so let's say domain users are able to log in, you can actually look at the permissions of what groups and users are allowed to be admins. And then you can target those users. You have to go the AD route to get around it, but essentially, yeah. Um, so the... The cool thing, the awesome thing here, is that PowerCLI, which is the API access for VMware built into PowerShell, is fully functional. At least everything that I've tried is fully functional inside of Linux PowerShell. And so if you install Linux or PowerShell on Linux, you have the power of PowerCLI. And it works okay over proxy chains. We'll talk about why, what little tweaks that have to happen here in a second. So the very first thing you have to do, and we're getting into the Jurassic part of this, is you create an OVA. And so if I create an OVA, um, I've tried a lot of different um, options here. And honestly, Alpine is the best of both worlds. Um, Linux, it's a Linux operating system that has a, a very easy package manager. I can install things that I need. Um, I can. I actually got Metasploit working on Alpine very easily, and it's super tiny. And I'm sure there are plenty of Linux gurus that are out there that have 
like that can tell me I can get it to 10 megs, I can get it to one meg. Um, this is the best I have. Um, and the great thing is that it fully supports um, interpreter reverse TCP. There's no EDR on it, there's no detection on it because it's my OVA. I don't have to install anything I want. Uh, I don't want to. And so if I have the ability to deploy a virtual machine on a VMware on a VMware network, you're not going to see it. Like you are if you look at the VMware logs. And we'll talk about detection in a second. But like those logs rarely go anywhere. No, like detection people or, or blue team, sorry, blue teams rarely forward those logs onto any sort of um, detection platform. And, and let me get, I'm getting too far. So um, deploying over over uh, proxy chains, um, one, of the, one of the important things here is that proxy chains three does not work with PowerShell. I don't know why, I haven't dug into it super deep, but proxy chains four, or proxy chains 4NG or all of the new versions of it out there does. Um, it does to a point. Um, so the interesting thing about proxy chains 4 is in PowerShell is that when you try and close PowerShell, or you, it just doesn't work. It stops working. So you can do anything you need to inside of the session while you're there, but exiting out, for me at least, doesn't work. So you have to kill the process. Um, and depending on how or where you are, um, that might mean that you're losing your shell. So I just want to warn you ahead of time, um, killing proxy chains with PowerShell in it um, is, is the only way to exit this. So anyways, we have this configuration and, and it's super simple. Here, here we go. Connect to the VI server there with the credential. Get the cluster. Get the VMware host, get the data, uh, data store. In this case, I'm specifying data store one. Um, pipe the VM host into import VA, uh, vapp with the OVA file and give it a name for the, um, for the VM and it boots. Um, and there are other configurations. You can tell it to always boot um, whenever the SXI server boots. Um, like there's a bunch of different configurations that you may or may not have permission to do, but if you have permission to deploy a, a VM, this is awesome because now you're in their infrastructure, you're in the target infrastructure, you're running, you can change where in location of where you're putting the VM, but I've I've never seen, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a very clean, well defined. Um, vCenter, like like people who put things in folders, sure. People who have everything in folders without any cruft on the side or extra VMs, never. So like putting a testing 01 VM out there and just letting it run and boot, no one's going to say anything. And that's persistence for days. Like you just, you're good. And the, the thing I want to talk about here, um, and it's probably already in your head is, well, I have to already have access to that. Well, like my malware has to already run for me to do this. I, I like this is not a this is not a outside in you know I can run malware kind of thing. And you're right. Like um, this is this is a post exploitation post initial exploitation persistence method. You have to have gotten in to do something. Now with the WSL stuff, with some of the other ways. Um, that we're going to be talking about, you can do it on first contact, but this is definitely, at least, unless they have vCenter listening to the internet, which does happen, um, uh, this is a post-exploitation thing. So, so what we talked about so far, go get in their cloud, um, do VMware pairing or um, uh, VPC pairing, then talk to their, their v internal vCenters, then you can do it. How about that? All right, protections. Most companies don't forward ESXi. We already talked about that. And honestly, I haven't seen any any talks, any presentations, any blog posts. And I might just be blind, right? Like there, there's the internet's gigantic, and there's probably someone out there. There's always someone who's done X um, 
whenever you think you've done X first, right? So, however, I haven't seen it where people are hunting for malware or malicious VMs. Um, it just isn't a thing that I've I've heard of, right? So um, there isn't a lot of defenders looking for this, right? Because those logs aren't looked at. Right? So one, it's hard to get logs off of VXXI. vCenter is a little easier because it's it's readily on Windows unless you have the Linux install and then you have to figure out how to forward from there. So it's not super simple, at least fr from what I've seen. Um, and so a lot of people don't do it. They focus on Windows logs, they focus on EDR, they focus on things. There's no EDR for ASX. There's no EDR that's gonna find this on vCenter. Um, and so you have to, you have to, have to, um, start looking at all of your virtualization platforms as we'll, you know, as we'll come clear through this talk, um, on how to get logs from those and how you can detect when a new VM is created and look into it. All right. Uh, that was my soapbox. Uh, but um, the the soapbox of this whole thing is that um, we need to empower our admins. Um, we need to empower our users to to create success, right? So we need we need to um, we need the concept of bug bounties and, and vulnerability disclosure. And I've actually been talking about this problem since whew, forever um, since I worked at General Electric and beyond. But like one of the interest one of the bad things about uh, this concept, right, is that it highlights an issue where where we don't have, as, as you know, general infosec, we don't have a good way for people to report bad behavior. And we, we, we have those phishing buttons that a lot of companies have, like, report this fish, click, and it goes, right? But we don't have a um, report this odd behavior other than the help desk, right? We don't have a internal bug bounty program. We don't have an internal uh, vulnerability disclosure program. We don't have a security, like how many of you would ever walk up to a security guard and say, hey, um, or uh, your building and say, hey, um, this guy tailgated. Not many, like just be honest, not many of you. Um, some definitely, and I know you definitely would, the person listening to this right now, you definitely would, but a lot of people wouldn't. So we need to we need to have ways for people to report vulnerabilities and, and weird stuff inside. And um, this actually goes back to uh, a talk which uh, is two talks ago uh, talking about uh, uh, phishing awareness and user awareness training. Anyways, soapbox done. Sorry, um, QEMU. Uh, many of you know QEMU. Um, QEMU. Uh, there's so many ways to pronounce it. Um, but did you know that you could run it on Windows? And not only can you run it on Windows, you can run Windows on Windows. So there's no official um, install of QMU for Windows. But this person right here, lastlog.free.frqmu, he has a wonderful, wonderful slimmed down version of QMU. If you get it, you can actually delete a bunch of the other stuff because it has um, um, uh, ways to boot um, ARM and and uh, X, uh, I three six three six and uh, all these different OSs. Right, you can actually get rid of the things that you don't need out of there and get it much much slimmer than fifty megs, um, which honestly isn't that much, right? The downside is that XP requires 1.4 gigs. I've actually slimmed it down to around 800 megs um, with compression and other things, uh, but it's still a gigantic way. However, um, I got Windows running on Windows running Poison Ivy. And so um, in my next slide, I can show you that this is a Windows 10 system, Windows 10 Pro running the currently latest version uh, update I think I'm one update uh, old on this slide, but then you have Poison Ivy, and that's the server side, but there's also the client side um, running that uh, 
is running inside that XP machine on Windows 10, the latest version, and Defender doesn't do anything about it. Um, like it's all in the image. So, so the attack path is, hey, um, uh, you know, unsuspecting user, here's a here's a bat file, um, which then just downloads the QEMU zip file and and um, and the image, which is a Q QCAL image, which again I got it down to around 800 megs. If you do that with Bits Installer or Bits. And you download all of this stuff and have it automatically unzip and run, then you have the whole thing. Again, this is this is not going to get me access to the client workstation. This is like this. This is so for persistence, for infection, for EDR. All of it focuses so much on that endpoint, right? But if I virtualize stuff and I only care about the the network access. And hopefully there's a lot of companies working towards zero trust in, and this will destroy that, but, um, or that will, that will destroy this. Um, the, the idea is all I want is that internal network access. And the way to do that is with the virtual, with emulation in this case, right? So I'm emulating, a, an OS. I have a, or, uh, a callback it doesn't even have to have admin access. In this case, like in the VMware case, you you had to have the permission to deploy. Um, with VMware Workstation, you don't. Um, with QMU, you don't even have to have anything installed. You can drop the zip file, uh, you know, unzip it, have all the, the virtualization there, and you're good. So here's how you would do that. Here's my XP one. And you get my MAC address too, or for the for the OS, but it's just QEMU system.exe, the WinXP image. You gotta specify where the BIOS information is for the uh, drivers and hard drives or the network stuff, um, the driver for the network. Um, and the interesting thing here is that you specify no graphics so that it doesn't show a, a, a um, GUI on the uh, on the front end. It's still running in the background. Um, you give it four processors, two gigs of RAM. Yes, someone can detect, you know, the usage of RAM, but Windows XP only really needs 512 megs. So you give it 512 megs and you're off to the races. And then you have Poison Ivy running on XP in on a system that has Defender. Ta-da! <laughs> um, um, and so um, that is one case I did. I I thought that bringing back something as 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 easily detectable as poison ivy um, would be just a fun use case, but like you can get so much so so much smaller. Um, the Linux um, the the test images that have Linux there ready for you um, that QEMU the one that I showed comes with. Um, it they have a three megabyte one, and the cool thing is you can run any processor you want, right? So, um, I don't even have to run x86 process like so that someone can look at it. I can run Q like ARM malware. I can run a interpreter session or a interpreter payload that is built in ARM, running in QMU. Have it only be like, you know, one two megs, three megs total for the entire thing, right? So you have the the ARM, uh, the the BIOS, the ARM, um, uh, QMU ex exe, uh, you know, a few other things, and we're talking. I think the the smallest I got my 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 uh, target zip file to send to a a, uh, a target um, on a on a engagement, I think it was around 19 megs, which if we're talking about malware, like. 19 megs isn't that isn't that big anymore. There's there's been malware that I've seen in the 50 meg range by default. Like the um the the um C sharp some of the C sharp malware is like 50 megs by default because it comes with like .NET Core and stuff, right? So um, there are ways to do that. The the benefits, however, to a Windows OS is that you can join it to the domain. I actually did this on an assessment where I had QMU running uh, a a small 
XP um, instance, the five, 800 meg one, 900 meg one. And it had, um, it was connecting out to me with the perturbator session. And I joined the domain with my current user permissions. Um, and then I was on the domain. I ran Bloodhound from that thing. Um, it took a while to get, you know, all the dependencies on there. But like, there's also Windows 10 IoT. Um, it does work kind of. Um, I, oh man, I have had hit or miss success with it running actually. Um, but Windows 10 IoT doesn't have Defender on it, at least the one I had. Like you can, there's no auto submission of malware stuff. It's, it's really great. Um, so that's QMU. Uh, we'll talk about um, on the workstation. Uh, Java Meterpreter, back to go into Java. Java is actually, it, Meterpreter, base Java Interpreter is detected by Defender. And um, and the and that's good, right? But pretty much no other malware on in I mean, oh, I mean the public stuff, like things that have been really detected all over the place. But if I make a malicious jar file, I have one that I made back in two thousand six. It still works, right? As long as it hasn't been widespread. And 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 uploaded to to virus total fifty times, like you're good, like no no EDR that I know of looks in the activities of a Java applet or Java a jar file and says this is malicious. Um, so if you're looking for initial uh, attack vector, right? If you're looking for initial access, then then a jar file. The stuff we used from 2006 to 2010 and, and whatever, like, it still works. You just can't put it inside of a browser. That's it. And so um, Java is still installed on a lot of operating systems um, or or um, available to be installed by a lot of operating systems. Uh, I actually was on an engagement a couple of years ago where, where we got onto a, a Mac system and Mac prompts you. It has the 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 symlink to say, hey, if a if Java is trying to initiate but is not installed yet, do the symlink. So the victim, the target, saw this this pop up saying, hey, you need to install Java, and they did it. They installed Java and then ran our malware again. It was great. It was fantastic. All right, so let's get into Docker really fast because I only got 10 minutes left. Um, Docker socket permissions are definitely uh, are needed, um, but like it's out there. Um, if you look for 2579, I think is the right one. It's great. Um, if Docker's already installed, um, you can run whatever you want. The interesting thing about Docker on Windows is that you can run a um, you can run a uh, a Windows OS or Windows kernel inside of there. I don't know for sure if Defender looks in there. I haven't done a lot of research into that part, but it definitely doesn't look on the Linux side because it's not looking for Linux malware. Um, and uh, <laughs> and putting Docker, like I said, Docker inside of Docker is, is a lot of fun. Protections, ensure antivirus. Ooh, that's weird spelling. Um, ensure antivirus and antivirus scans the Docker instances. ER solutions are just now starting to kind of look inside of Docker. Um, they're they're doing it sometimes on on Windows. Um, they're definitely not doing it on the Windows um, Windows kernel Docker images. Um, like I ran I ran Mimikatz. Well, this, that, I guess that answers my question from earlier. I ran Mimikatz on a Docker instance, uh, a Windows Docker instance on my Windows 10 machine. It worked just fine. Uh, WSL, let's get into this really fast. WSL can be per user. It can be installed cur uh, currently. WSL2 is basically Hyper-V, so there's no installing custom images here. Uh, and so you can install custom images uh, and choose between Windows and Linux, like we just said. And this this is it. 
this is how you install WSL via command line. It does require um, admin access, but if your target has admin access already, um, you can install directly from uh, the command line. And it takes three commands. Um, two of them are PowerShell based. Now, this downloads an APPX. Um, it's a signed APPX. There is ways to install non-signed APPXs. It's not easy. Um, so you can inject your own thing, but I like to install the verified uh, version and then modify it afterwards. And so modifying afterwards, you just go into user profile on app data, local packages. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, uh, randomized string there. It's not easy. You have to do an LS at least once. Then you just install your rc.local, make sure it exits just like normal, and you have Linux persistence for days. It's great. This one is a tough one. I don't know if there's any other protections you can do with WSL. Um, the scanning is not there yet. The, the inspection is not there yet. And with WSL2, Hyper-V is, is getting there, um, but I, I'm not sure. VMware Workstation, I got to get into this quickly. Um, deploying can be done via command line. The, the file system can be mounted and edited. Um, sorry, no idea on protections. And that's it for me. I went really fast. So um, the, the the point here uh, is that a virtualization and emulation are are out there. They're getting more popular. They're getting built into the operating systems. Um, I have seen VirtualBox just installed on client machines because they had um, a a solution. Um, for system management that required some virtualization drivers. And so VirtualBox core uh, kernel is being installed on every single endpoint. And so all I did was run a VM permanently and tell it to boot every time the user boots and there's no like booted in headless mode. And it just ran like the, the core concept here is not getting on the system to target the system. It's getting on the system to target the network. And that's the mind change that you have to do as a malware developer, right? You have to think, okay, it, the endpoint is just the starting point. The endpoint I don't need access to. The endpoint, I all I need is what networks it connects to. And that's the goal, right? If you focus on that part of it, you can do more virtualization and, and malware all day, every day, in so many things that are supported across the board on every platform. Like, um, you, if you think a little sort of inside the box, I guess, if you think inside the virtualization box, you can get there. And that's all I have. Thank you very much for having me, Zifcon. You guys are amazing. Um, uh, I love Zifcon. And I hope everyone has a excellent quarantine, non-quarantine, mask, no mask day. Well, yeah, th thanks, Mubix. Um, so just to just to sum it up, so you're saying that y using these VM technologies is for creating a sort of pivot point inside the organ target organization or network you want to access, and use that pivot point to access other. Uh, assets on the network yes exactly like virtualization and emulation are your persistence methods where where edrs and all of these other platforms have have started really digging into like getting malware out and making sure that it doesn't run if you can install and be part of the infrastructure you're you're golden you're you're never going to be looked at not at least not yet and i'm hoping that giving this presentation it gets us to the point where we're starting to look at these types of um, infections.